afternoon, North Dakota. Uh, today, uh, statistically, uh, marks the worst uh, day yet uh, for North Dakota uh, during uh, the pandemic. Uh, <clears throat> we've got a record number of cases uh, in terms of record number of daily cases, record number of total active cases, uh, and uh, record number of daily reported hospitalizations and a record number of deaths and our second highest positivity rate. And we'll cover all that in more detail shortly. But uh, <clears throat> to put it into context, though, here in North Dakota, we this isn't just a uh, North Dakota problem, it's also uh, a national problem, a regional problem, it's a global problem. And all over the world we're seeing rising cases as we head into the, the winter, the traditional flu season. And yesterday, <clears throat> the United States alone, for the first time, reported 103,000 uh, new COVID uh, infections in, in one day. And relative to the, as a nation, uh, the relative to going back to the beginning of this earlier in 2020, uh, the top five uh, days of cases in the United States have all been in the last, in the last week. Uh, within the United States, the upper Midwest, really from the Great Plains to the, the Rockies area, of which North Dakota is really in the center of that, uh, continues to see uh, some of the highest uh, per capita rates and some of the highest positivity rates. And again, we know that this is, uh, uh, that the coronavirus thrives when it has an opportunity uh, to move into confined spaces where people are in close contact with each other, uh, crowded spaces, perhaps with poor uh, ventilation and then amplified by uh, loud talking and and uh, no masking. And of course, we also have when we heat our spaces here, uh, we've got low humidity. With low humidity, the aerosol droplets remain suspended longer, and all of this creates an ideal transmission environment uh, for coronavirus. So, again, uh, I, I mention this environment because there are many places we can be in North Dakota where we are physically distanced and outdoors or physically distanced and in spaces in our own homes where we might be completely safe. And then there's other areas uh, which probably represent a, a small percentage of the total uh, square footage or square miles of our states, but those places where we congregate uh, and in those conditions, those temperature and humidity uh, and maskless uh, close contact conditions with low ventilations, those are those are high high spreading areas. And so again, uh, we learn to learn to identify uh, where what areas might be safe for you or not safe for you if you're vulnerable, what areas where you might become infected and become a spreader or not. So again, to be able to identify that because this virus does not thrive equally in all uh, environments. We know it does much more poorly outdoors uh, than it does in these uh, indoor low humidity. Uh, we also uh, have talked a lot about <clears throat> Uh, why we need to do more and about individuals finding their own why, but there's a collective why which we need to focus on, which we've been talking about since the very beginning, which is we need to slow the spread of this virus uh, to preserve hospital capacity. <clears throat> and Chris Jones is with us today. He'll be talking about that topic a little later. And, and so again, uh, as I've also shared uh, with this national uh, record cases and hospitalizations going up around the country, also hospitalizations going up uh, in our neighboring uh, states because, we, again, we do share healthcare systems, particularly uh, with Minnesota and South Dakota, where we have a lot of uh, Minnesota patients that are hospitalized in North Dakota hospitals. And uh, and then, of course, we share uh, providers uh, that spread across both Minnesota and South Dakota. But Minnesota also had a record uh, yesterday of uh, 918 Minnesotans that were hospitalized, including a record 203 in ICU. And uh, South Dakota has seen their number of people hospitalized with COVID uh, to 483. And so, again, uh, we know that uh, the hospitalization pressure is happening uh, nationally and regionally, even within the systems which we that, that provide in North Dakota. We, we, as we've noted uh, several weeks ago, uh, or last month, we began our regular calls with mayors and county commissioners that represent uh, just under 80% of the state uh, population. Uh, and again, like leaders of communities of all sizes, uh, they're really uh, 
doing their job as local local elected leaders. And we've talked about it all along and even as part of our administration from the very beginning, we've had a phrase called leadership everywhere. And what this means is uh, for us to move the state forward, we've got to have leadership at all levels. And whether that's at the school district level, the school board level, the county commission, the township, the uh, city, the mayor, uh, but it also can mean individuals. Uh, a teacher can be a leader, an example for their, their students. Parents uh, are obviously leaders every day in helping uh, shape uh, their, their, their children and their activities and their choices. And so again, when we think about as a, our state rising up to this incredible historic challenge, we really need leadership at all level. And sometimes I'm inspired too, because when we, it's not just adults, we've got uh, young students at very young ages that are, uh, that are that are doing uh, great work at inspiring their peers and their parents uh, in terms of how to how to navigate uh, smartly uh, through this. From talking with our mayors and county commissioners today, I know that they're all reporting that they're learning from each other, being inspired by each other, and sharing ideas at the local level. Where this is where the levels of, of control exist, whether it's uh, permits for large gatherings, whether it's uh, liquor licenses, uh, <clears throat> whether it's uh, uh, approvals, uh, you know, coordination with the local public health, all of these things can happen locally and local leaders can know uh, which of their community members and organizations are uh, complying with uh, the recommended guidance and which ones uh, may not be because many of these communities are small enough that the mayors can either uh, just even by driving around or or being connected with the, they and their other commissioners know where their where opportunities are for additional mitigation and we've seen uh, many of them take additional steps uh, that are to try to again uh, in reduce, reduce the number of transmissible moments. And we're also heard a number of them that are either have considerations coming up uh, at next week, Monday or Tuesday, um, county or city commission. So I expect that we're gonna see more discussions about local mitigation uh, measures. Uh, we also heard some very fun ideas. Uh, Mayor Johnson from Devil's Lake had several, but one of them uh, that again, I think when we talk about local leadership is doing a local public service announcement, uh, including high school kids and, and college students uh, that to help in those local PSAs. We know that this is uh, something where if we're trying to get uh, more uh, mitigation and more participation from the kind of teenager through age 29, the very social age group that all of us might remember in our lives. Uh, but within that, if we can have peers uh, being uh, examples to peers, that can also is proven as a method to help get more, uh, more participation in mitigation strategies. So again, uh, thanks to all of our mayors and county commissioners for all the great work you're doing and all the leadership you're doing uh, on the ground. As you know, in North Dakota, uh, we have no mayors in the entire state all the way up through our largest cities that are full-time paid employees. Those are all part-time elected officials. And, and again, in North Dakota, we've got the highest percentage of elected, elected people per capita. So we really literally do have leadership everywhere and we're counting on all of them to be, to be part of the, the solution. We also know at the county level, uh, we heard today that both Steele and Trail counties have implemented countywide mask mandates. Uh, Wapaton, uh, we heard today, had initiated one last week that went into effect on Monday morning. So Mayor Dale and his team down there doing that. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of great collaboration at the local level between uh, the cities and their local healthcare providers uh, working co to collectively together and with local public health, whether it's on testing or making sure that everybody's informed about their hospital capacity. And we're also seeing strong collaboration between uh, the universities uh, in our state and the uh, local local leadership. And again, that coordination really, uh, really matters. And we know that uh, some of these actions that have been taken recently, it takes uh, a couple of two week cycles to see whether the measures that people are really are taking are making a difference. Uh, people shouldn't expect instant results, uh, but we've, as we've seen around the country, that if we do the work now and you take mitigation efforts to slow the spread, uh, we will see uh, the curves dropping later. The other thing which we want to talk about too is last Friday, uh, we had an opportunity to have another in-depth discussion about vaccines and the potential for vaccines arrival. And uh, from the 
the conversation that we had directly with the White House team and led and that conversation being led by Secretary Azar and everyone else. Uh, again, there is uh, <clears throat> four moving to five manufacturers that are gonna be coming forward with vaccine candidates. Some of those are gonna be present as early as Q1 of this next year. Uh, the the possibility of having an effective vaccine. Uh, in this case, uh, the, 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 uh, they've got a very clear target that they're shooting at, and the cases, the size of the phase three human trials, normally in regular world of uh, pharmacy and medicine advancement, those might be 10,000 person trials. Uh, here we're doing uh, 30,000 to 60,000 person trials, and that uh, is uh, uh, no, there are no shortcuts that have been taken. They walk through all the same steps that they're doing from a clinical standpoint uh, and actually making it uh, more uh, comprehensive because of the increased size of the vaccine trials. But where the federal government and the administration is making great uh, efforts to speed things up has to do with the, uh, the actual parallel production. These vaccines that are in trial right now in phase three in these 30 to 60,000 trials, if they actually uh, succeed in working uh, and then we're gonna move to distribution, sometimes that can be as long as a year lag uh, to where you ramp up manufacturing. Uh, the federal government through Project Warp Speed uh, is investing uh, in the manufacturer. And so we know that in one case, there's at least 15 million doses that have been made that are in process of being manufactured right now. So once the day the approval begins, uh, then steps in, uh, FEMA uh, and the opportunity for the for the planning to begin the distribution. And again, uh, to be clear, uh, in the United States, there's no such thing as mandatory vaccinations in the United States. Uh, but if there is people that choose, say if you're over the age 70 and you're in a highly vulnerable and uh, to this and you choose to take a vaccine, think of it as like a flu shot, uh, you take your vaccine and if we can substantially reduce the risk of death in people over the age of 70, that would be a, just a gigantic game changer in what we were doing as a country. And so there is, uh, again, uh, record effort going on in the whole biosciences world and with the great support from the federal government response here in terms of putting dollars into manufacturing, we can take uh, actually increased comprehensive testing of vaccines, but we can have a, uh, a, a vaccine get to production and out uh, much faster. Uh, so with that, again, the point is that the mitigation that we're being driven uh, across the state by our guidelines and, and implemented and executed on at the local level, uh, that these are things that perhaps we don't have to do forever because uh, we know that we're gonna look back at this year, uh, 2020 and 2021 and say those were the years of the pandemic. There will be a time when this is all behind us, uh, but one of the things that we have uh, on the near-term horizon is a <clears throat> the potential for vaccine vaccines that could truly be life-saving for those people that are most uh, vulnerable. Uh, also uh, in the, uh, the weekly report uh, that we get from the White House, again, uh, as they talk about the, the things that they're looking for, for all states and for those in North Dakota that are in the middle of the COVID storm uh, to reinforce, including uh, wearing masks, physical distancing, hand hygiene, uh, avoiding or eliminating opportunities for maskless crowding uh, in public and whether those are bars or events uh, or other uh, gatherings. Uh, and then we'll talk about this later, but again, getting a flu shot and flu immunization is another way that we can help preserve hospital capacity. Uh, and if you do all that, the other thing is we head into the holiday season, we're gonna keep talking about, but if we eliminate gathering in public spaces and at work uh, or at, you know, at, uh, at say bars, if you eliminate all that, but everybody decides to gather at house parties or private social gatherings. Uh, if you do that, then we're just we're just moving the maskless transmission moment to another location and, and hurting our businesses in the process. So the key here is to understand that uh, it, it doesn't work if you're like, hey, I was really careful all day when I was at school, uh, whether I was you know teaching or a student, I was really careful all day at work because we got great policies at work about mask wearing and distancing. But then the minute I leave my school or my work, and then I head out for my social life, I immediately get into uh, large 
private gatherings, whether those are in public or in private locations, uh, because and just because they might be people you know doesn't mean that there wouldn't be people there that would be transmitting because again, one of the insidious parts of this is that asymptomatic people, people with no symptoms can be uh, people that uh, are high spreaders. So again, as we head into Thanksgiving, one thing to identify is, you know, who's, you, who's your core group? Who's your family group? Are they all practicing? Uh, because uh, you can avoid the quarantine and the illness later by, uh, you know, being smart, not only yourself and your family, but the other core groups that you're interacting with. Um, and again, uh, the contact tracing that we're doing in the state would say that what we have here is really unrelenting and significant community spread. Uh, and that's largely happening outside of work and out of school. It's happening because of the social gatherings, the social nature of people. And so that is uh, something to keep in mind as we head forward. Uh, when we take a look at the, uh, the national uh, uh, surge in cases that we have here and the rising cases around the around our area <clears throat> when we we take a look at the new cases just in the last seven days we look at places like with you know starting with the Great Lakes with Illinois with over 50,000 cases in Wisconsin 30,000 Minnesota 21,000 uh, all of these new cases and those states uh, generally uh, North Dakota with less cases but we're doing uh, two to two and a half times more testing than, uh, than some, of those, uh, some of those states in the Great Lakes. When we look across, uh, all the way across to other states, uh, you know, as far away as uh, Idaho and others, uh, in some cases we're doing almost nine or 10 times as much testing uh, as others. So relative to this regional storm and national storm that we're in, uh, even though we're seeing records in our own state, we're also on a, on a relative basis uh, know that we're, uh, uh, performing uh, better than what we what within some of the re, in the region are and if we take a look at the national surge in cases on a percentage basis on a percent positivity on the next slide uh, you can see again that even though we're at record levels here in North Dakota moving up uh, we're still in some cases at you know a half to a, a third of the positivity including those of our uh, immediate immediate neighbors and so again we don't like where we don't like where we are relative to where we've been uh, but but we do uh, do want to thank uh, all North Dakotans who who are practicing uh, the North Dakota Smart Guidelines and who have all along those people that are physical distancing and wearing masks, practicing good hand hygiene and avoiding, uh, you know, crowded uh, transmissible areas because it's your choices that are helping uh, to have our numbers uh, be better than what we're seeing nationally, internationally, and in, in the in the region. When we take a look at the uh, the numbers in terms of the case breakdown, uh, again, uh, records here, 9,224 record number of active cases. First time we've been above 9,000. <clears> the <throat> 16.4 positivity over the last seven days, that is a, a record. Uh, and uh, which we report uh, every week. Uh, and the, we also uh, have uh, 231 people hospitalized. And that is a, a from a daily reporting record, uh, the highest. We do restate those sometimes when we get all the final charges and discharges. That's down a little bit uh, from uh, a number that was slightly higher than that now in a restatement. But in terms of a daily report, that is our, the highest that we have. When we take a look at the statewide positive rate on uh, on uh, tests on a rolling 14 day, which we've been tracking, again, uh, we don't like the direction that continues to climb up. Uh, but as we saw in some of the other uh, other states in the region, they've had their positivity rate uh, shoot up into the 20%, uh, 30%, 40%, even now crossing 50% in some states. So we are uh, pleased that we're here, but we're not pleased that it's got this uh, steady upward climb. And that's where we're you know, calling on all of you uh, to do your part uh, to help us uh, slow the spread and get these numbers uh, turning down. And again, when we take a look at hospitalization, um, we are uh, again, uh, seeing that this number has had kind of a steady climb to it, and this is of, of uh, uh, you know, real real concern to us. Uh, we have uh, 231 people that were hospitalized due to COVID-19, meaning that's why they went in uh, with the uh, uh, increased in-depth hospital reporting. And we have this been on the dashboard now for some time. But once, if someone is hospitalized for a reason other than COVID, uh, whether call it a, a 
you know, trauma or sports injury or that you come in for a, a scheduled knee surgery. Uh, when people come into the hospital for these other things, they're, then they're tested when they uh, are arriving for, for surgery and other stuff. We have another 121 people uh, in the hospital right now who are not there due to COVID, but they're hospitalized and they have COVID. And again, uh, more details on that are on the, uh, the dashboard, but uh, t together uh, that, is, that is a number of uh, 352 individuals who are in the hospital that have uh, COVID-231 that are there uh, due to COVID. When we take a look at around the state on the, uh, <clears throat> Uh, the, the active cases, the darker the county, the more active cases. And we can see that, again, uh, not surprisingly, because this is not divided at all by population, this is just the numerator, the, the number of cases. Our large population counties, uh, Grand Forks, Cass, uh, uh, the Burley Morton area ward uh, tend to have uh, more cases. Uh, when we take a look at tr trying to really understand what's the, the penetration of that relative to population on the, the next slide, we see a different story, but this helps us really understand the spread. Up in the far uh, northeast uh, corner uh, of the state, uh, you know, from uh, uh, Walsh to, uh, uh, and to the northwest of there, uh, those are places where we, again, we've got uh, uh, more than 200 the darkest colors, more than 200 cases per 10,000 residents. Uh, when we take a look at, uh, at Burley Morton as a metro area versus Cass, it's got uh, almost double the number of cases per 10,000 and uh, Ward uh, almost triple the number of cases uh, per 10,000 than you would have in Cass. So again, we've got uh, areas of the state where there, and again, all of these areas of larger populations, those county and city leaders were all on we're all on the uh, call today uh, and action being taken there locally, uh, again, uh, through local task force and local, local initiatives. But again, we do have, uh, we do have cases uh, uh, occurring and increasing uh, across the state in a broad, a broad way. Uh, you know, having uh, taken a look at all of these uh, uh, movement that's going up. We've got some announcements that we're gonna make effective tomorrow at uh, tomorrow, f Friday, November 6th at 5 p.m. Uh, and, and, and and as we do this, we're gonna be moving uh, no counties down, but a number of counties up. Uh, as you know, we've got this five count, five risk level, uh, and we have had up until uh, Today, as some that have managed to be in the low area, uh, moderate uh, is the uh, is our middle, and then we go to uh, orange and then red. But people that were in green that were moving to yellow uh, include the following counties: Billings, Burke, Cavalier, Divide, Griggs, Logan, Oliver, Pierce, Ransom, Renville, Sargent, Sheridan, Slope, and Steele. And I'll make a. A small notation here is that there were uh, a few of these that might have uh, been able to to the low case counts because we looked at, at counties that were had less than 20 actives uh, sometimes differently. Uh, but those that fell into that category uh, include counties that don't have uh, any health care in the county. So they're going to a county that's either uh, either yellow or orange uh, for healthcare. They may be going there for shopping. They may be going there for, for school. Uh, there's a lot of movement between some of our low population counties and our higher ones. And so again, uh, the, the virus doesn't recognize the county lines. Uh, we think that there's a, uh, you know, these are good for setting kind of regional guidelines around the state. But at the point we are right now with the level of cases we have, the level of positivity we have, the, the level of hospitalization we have statewide uh, that we need to, uh, as we all sort of are in this together, uh, that no county in the state will have a designation uh, lower than uh, yellow on this. We've got eight counties that were at the yellow, the moderate list level that are moving into the high risk level. Those eight counties include Barnes, Grant, Kidder, Pemina, Roulette, Stutzman, Trail, and Wells. And a total of uh, 31 counties are remaining consistent at their current level. Uh, they're listed here for the sake of Lindsay. I won't read all those. Uh, the uh, 25 counties are remaining at the high risk or the uh, uh, 
orange level and six are, that were at, at the moderate or yellow list are remaining there. So again, we have, we'll have no counties at the lower and no counties at the new normal, so no blue or green. And so this is what the statewide map uh, looks like right now. And uh, as of uh, last month, we've also added uh, shading there for the tribal nations with whom we share geography uh, as we continue to work uh, closely with them as well. Uh, many of those uh, tribal leaders uh, also have uh, implemented uh, uh, nationwide or tribal-wide uh, mask mandates and other mitigation uh, efforts within within their uh, the boundaries of their uh, reservations. So, uh, with that, um, we want to talk about the important topic of of uh, hospital capacity, and and uh, here to do that, of course, is Chris Jones, uh, who is the uh, executive director of our Department of Human Services. Thank you, Chris, for being here. Good afternoon. In March, hospital capacity was one of the key metrics that we planned and prepared for with multiple tiers to add beds, to add locations, and to add staff. This plan was done with the best available information at the time, both from a clinical perspective and a logistical perspective. The inpatient surge obviously didn't occur at that time, and at the time, North Dakota ranked fifth in the nation as it relates to inpatient beds per thousand populations. So early on in this pandemic, there was little information as to clinical best practices, and through the process of science, the medical community continues to refine practices, as well as has developed new therapeutics, such as remdesivir and convalescent plasma. As such, the average time in the hospital has reduced significantly to an average length of stay of approximately seven days. Additionally, hospitals reduced normal operations early on in the pandemic in preparations for COVID patients. This has now created a backlog of unmet demand that the medical community has been catching up on. Finally, there is additional demand due to some patients not seeking regular medical care during this pandemic. This at times can put additional strains on the hospital due to sicker patients needing hospitalizations. Which leads us to today. Planning assumptions need to be modified just as the scientific process is continually refined. Hospital capacity has been one of the four pillars of saving lives and livelihoods. Today is one of the most stressed times the healthcare system has been in. It is stressing the system's capacity and the stress is primarily from a staffing perspective. Staffing, there's not only an increase in overall admissions, but also because healthcare workers needing to isolate and quarantine due to the nature of their work, but also due to local community spread. Finally, there are increased hospitalizations all across the country, so there is no extra staff to bring in. The level of surge is constrained by the number of available healthcare workers. Additionally, on top of the dollars health systems have received from the federal government early on in the pandemic, at the last emergency commission and budget section, the state approved the distribution of $10 million across the state's largest six hospitals, the referral hospitals, to assist with staffing incentives given the staffing constraints. With that said, hospital capacity can only be improved by the following factors. Reduce community spread, by communities following smart restart guidelines. That is a community lever to pull to improve hospital capacity. Additionally, individuals can need to continue to seek regular routine outpatient care because if you are not receiving your regular care, you are coming into the hospital and taking up a bed potentially. Please seek your regular routine care. And finally, the main lever that hospitals have to pull is to again redu reduce urgent, non-emergent services in hospitals, such as elective surgeries. As a state, we must rely on medical professionals, healthcare administrators, and science to inform these decisions that are made. As the governor said, we need leaders in their areas of expertise to continue to stand up and lead 
and shift community perception about the seriousness of COVID within each community. Some may say we need to lock down across the state to free up capacity. As has been said before, the boundaries of the state are geographical and not medical. Some of the hospital capacity constraints that the state of North Dakota is feeling is due to transfers in from Minnesota, South Dakota, and Montana, all of whom have taken different approaches to limit community spread. Finally, bed capacity is a, at a single point in time along with those hospitalized with COVID has been used as a reporting measure. This is not necessarily the best transparency measure. Hospitals are complex organizations that must be nimble, flexible, and organic every minute of the day. To only look at these two measures at a point in time does not tell the whole story, especially in the environment we are in today. However, this does not diminish the significant additional strain being put on health systems and prime <clears throat> and primarily the physicians, nurses, and other staff in the hospital. For those of you who do, do, do not believe, go and talk to them. Ask them what it's like. Ask them about the impact it has on their family. Ask them about the impact it has on them as they treat patients with COVID and other citizens seeking care. We are working more closely with hospitals <clears throat> and their individual capacity plans to have more transparency in where they are and to keep everyone informed. Each health system is organized in different ways, which mean they may have different levers to pull to adjust to capacity constraints. We wanna work in a collaborative manner to ensure we know where they are in terms of meeting community need, not just COVID related, but all medical needs. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and to really hit on that point about the interaction between community spread and what, what you can do to help take care of our hospital capacity is uh, by you taking care of your own health uh, and you making sure that you're not spreading COVID to others, meaning you're following the guidelines of physical distancing and avoiding massless crowds, et cetera, you're actually helping to preserve hospital capacity. So again, as I said at the beginning, there's a lot of reasons to find your why, whether that's a, uh, your team, your school, your family, your church, uh, your you know, elderly grandparents, your, your elders that you respect, uh, fellow tribal members, whatever it is, you find your why. But there's somebody out there that if there's not healthcare workers in your family, uh, us finding our why to help protect those healthcare workers uh, is really, uh, really, really key. And uh, and again, your work can help take pressure off of them. And one way you can do that uh, by protecting yourself and others, in addition to everything else, is getting your flu shot. And, and we, uh, again, uh, every year we've got flu shot campaigns in the state of North Dakota through our Department of Health and local public health. Uh, again, uh, we would like to see an increase in flu shots out this year versus a decrease. Some people may have been avoiding these, as Chris talked about. Do not avoid your regular maintenance Care, that'll help you avoid needing a hospital bed uh, later. But there are many ways to get a flu shot uh, today, uh, including many pharmacies can deliver them on site. And so again, if you've got any questions about that, you can check in with your local public health, North Dakota Department of Health, or your provider on getting uh, of flu shots. And many of those are covered by insurance. If you're concerned about the cost of a flu shot, again, reach out to us at the hotline and we'll make sure that you can get connected uh, with a, a flu shot. Uh, also, uh, earlier when we talked about, you know, hospital capacity too is about making sure we can ensure that we can take care of people at the highest levels of care. And 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 I did want to say we get with the, with the record 29 uh, deaths we had today. From a data standpoint, 20 of those were in the normal reporting uh, time frame. When we report deaths each day, they're in the uh, 
reported over the last three days. Nine of those 29 that were reported today were, were outside that reporting window, so would have occurred uh, prior to the last three days, uh, but it does not diminish in any way uh, the fact that our hearts and prayers and go out to all of those families of people who've lost a loved one uh, during this crisis, and that would be another opportunity for us as North Dakotans to, to find a why, because we want to preserve hospital capacity. We want to give everybody a, 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 the best opportunity they can to uh, survive COVID if they do contract it. Uh, the next uh, topic we want to go to is uh, comes from the Department of Commerce and relates to uh, the uh, hospitality uh, economic resiliency grants, which again were approved by the Emergency Commission, the budget section recently. And these are uh, uh, hospitality businesses include uh, uh, restaurants, bars, breweries, cafes, and others. And the hospitality ERGs will focus on, on uh, also can focus on theaters, music, drama, and entertainment venues, professional production companies that support major venues. All of those folks are uh, eligible. Hospitality uh, ERG will be used to for costs like operations, payroll, rent, utilities, technology, and other expenses that comply with federal guidelines. Maximum grant per eligible entity is 25,000, 75,000, and max for eligible entities with multiple locations. And if you receive grant locations uh, for more than one location, uh, they can only have to spend it per location. Receipts are required to comply with the North Dakota Smart Restart protocols, uh, meaning again, uh, that if you're gonna get these get these grant dollars and use these to keep your business open during this time frame. There's an expectation that, uh, a strict, strict expectation that those businesses receiving grants will be complying uh, with the smart, North Dakota Smart Restart protocols, which tie back to the, the county risk level colors. Uh, there's gonna be a special business briefing uh, on November 10th at 10 a.m. Uh, through the Department of Commerce in partnership with the Greater North Dakota Chamber, and the North Dakota Hospital Association. And so again, uh, you can, uh, uh, can learn more about that. The additional information is gonna be available soon at blegendary.link slash ERG. And of course, I'm sure there'll also be links out uh, on the uh, ndresponse.gov website. But again, if you're one of those businesses, make sure you learn more about this grant program. Also, I'll give a shout out too, that in addition to that, uh, the Bank of North Dakota has their interest buy-down program that applies to businesses in, within hospitality, as well as outside of hospitality. If you're a hospitality, business, you can qualify both for the Bank of North Dakota interest buy-down and the Economic Resiliency Grant through Commerce. So check out both of those programs uh, uh, ASAP. Those dollars need to be dispersed before December 30th uh, in conjunction with the CARES Act guidelines. Uh, next topic is a behavioral health update. This summer, the behavioral health team was awarded a $2 million grant to support the state's behavioral health response to COVID-19. Uh, the emergency grant to address mental and substance abuse disorders uh, focuses on the needs of individuals with addiction or mental health concerns and providing care to others uh, as a caregiver uh, can lead to stress, anxiety, fear, and other strong emotions. So Behavioral Health Division has partnered with Sanford Health to offer support and engagement to those individuals who are providing uh, healthcare workers that are providing uh, their own mental health concerns uh, as they work through this. Uh, this is called REACH for Resilience program and Sanford Health is providing outreach to all licensed basic care facility, licensed assisted living facilities, licensed skilled nursing facilities, hospitals, critical care hospitals, and offering support and resources. And so if you're a healthcare worker, uh, you can call directly uh, to the Reach for Resilience at 701-365-4920. Uh, and uh, that's a Monday through Friday. Be connected with a mental health expert or request additional program information. And of course, if you want to learn more about that Reach for Resilience, you can find it out at the, the uh, Human Services website under the Behavioral Health Division. Got another piece of good news uh, to share today in the midst of our pandemic, and this is we announced a 2.5 million in emergency grant relief has been awarded to North Dakota College and Universities. This is on top of the uh, all the dollars that have been awarded uh, through the uh, 
CARES Act dollars, but on top of that, there was a program that was created uh, called GEAR, the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Funds, uh, and these are part of 5.94 million in CARES Act funding to support local education agencies and higher education institutions, and this is distributed through the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, more than 40 proposals were submitted. It was a competitive grant uh, process, and uh, those grants were awarded this week uh, to a number of awardees, uh, and uh, 2.5 million in, in emergency grants uh, given out, I think, to over a dozen institutions, and we look forward to the impact these grants will have on our students' continuing education, uh, and the those in higher education, uh, having reviewed those, a number of those related to supporting uh, our nursing education programs uh, within higher education. So in line with what we need right now, which is additional uh, staffing within healthcare. And we, separate from that, there's a competitive grant process uh, that was being held for the GEAR funding, the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund for K-12. Those applications are still being evaluated, so there'll be news about the K-12 grants uh, in the near future. On a gratitude uh, section uh, that we have for today, uh, of course, we can always be grateful that uh, as Americans, we have what people in some parts of the world do not have, and that's the opportunity uh, and the right uh, for every legal citizen to cast a vote. And so today I want to say thank you to the uh, all the North Dakotans who contributed their voice to the 220 election. It was a record turnout in our state, approximately 363,000 uh, voters or 62% of eligible voters cast their ballots in this election. Uh, so again, thank you for exercising uh, your role in, in our country and your participation play, your participation voting is, plays an invaluable role. You know, a valuable role. Uh, we also want to share uh, our deepest appreciation, starting with Secretary of State Al Jager uh, and his entire team. In addition to that, uh, literally thousands of local and county election workers and local accounting boards and, and uh, those across the state who worked hard and had attention to detail to ensure that our elections are fair and accurate. And again, uh, many of them working long hours uh, uh, preparing uh, the record number of mail-in and absentee ballots prior to the election so that counting could go smoothly on election day in our state. So again, uh, great work to uh, Secretary Jager, his team, and all of the election officials across the state. And then closing out uh, with our uh, gratitude quote for the day, uh, uh, American uh, teacher and anthropologist, 78-year-old uh, Joan Halifax said, uh, we live at a time when science is validating what humans have known through the ages, that compassion is not a luxury, it's a necessity for well-being, resilience, and survival. And I'm sure when Joan Halifax wrote that, she wasn't thinking about a time of, of, uh, of a pandemic, uh, because uh, when we talk about compassion being a necessity for well-being, resilience, and survival, I think that really ties in with what we're talking about here because compassion can also be a key tool in helping us slow the spread of coronavirus because as we uh, think beyond ourselves as individuals and think of ourselves as part of a family, a community, a school, uh, whatever group that you see, then in addition to our individual responsibility, we've got responsibility to our neighbors and to our friends and to our families. And we have responsibility in societal responsibility to those that we may not have met, like the healthcare workers are on the front line. And so again, uh, but if someone puts on a mask uh, before they go into a store, they're actually, uh, they're, they're, what they're actually doing is they're exhibiting compassion for people that they've, for an unknown person that they may not have met. And so I think when you see people exercising uh, mitigation efforts uh, to make sure that we can slow the spread and care for those in our state, uh, think about those people as people that are, that are giving compassion. And then lastly, uh, to close out, maybe a challenge to all North Dakotans, uh, you know, there's always the question that we get every day is, uh, you know, what is, what is government going to do and shouldn't government be doing more? And I think the, the answer to that is really also a question back to you is, is what are you as an individual going to do? 
because with the freedoms that we have in our country, everybody is free right now to take to act with compassion uh, and to act uh, smartly in terms of slowing the spread uh, and helping you know save, literally save lives. Your actions literally can save lives as well as save the livelihoods of all of your favorite businesses in your community. So with that, uh, we want to close with a question is, what are you going to do to help slow the spread? Because uh, the guidelines are out there. We've put them out in all the counties. Uh, and now you as a business owner, you as an individual, uh, take a look at them and decide what are you, your family, your business going to do to be part of the solution for North Dakota as we head into this uh, challenging period in terms of, of a climate, uh, in terms of the, the cold weather coming and us being more indoors, and then also a season of gathering and how we're going to gather safely indoors. Uh, we've got challenges ahead of us, but I believe in North Dakotans. I know that North Dakotans are compassionate. I've seen North Dakota neighbors help neighbors throughout my life, and I know that we'll step up to it here. And from what I hear from the mayors from around the state is they're all seeing higher levels of participation and higher levels of understanding. And so I'm very encouraged by what I'm hearing from the mayors and uh, move forward with optimism and a belief that North Dakotans are going to get through this and come through stronger than ever. So with that, we're going to stand for questions. We've got a record number of people here today, so we'll, we'll do uh, one question apiece, and, uh, and, but we'll do multiple ones online, but I'm going to start in room with, uh, with Maddie. This is actually for Chris Jones. Okay, perfect. First question is for Chris Jones. Um, you mentioned that bed capacity isn't the best measure of hospital strain. Um, so can you elaborate on that and what a better measure might be? Yeah, um, <clears throat> of course. So in a hospital, if you take that point in time at one time, you could have 10 patients in the ER, you're working on discharging other patients. And so there, there's different ebbs and flows based on the needs of those patients, based on shift changes within a hospital. So it's, if they just give that one point in time, that is for that one point in time. And what we need to understand is they, they have their own capacity plans that they use. They know whether they're at their green status or their yellow status or their red status. And that's based on where they're at with staffing. How many, op how many open shifts do they have? How, what is the acuity of patients in the building at that time? Can they start to step down other patients sooner rather than later? And they are really in the best position to do this. this hospitals aren't like hotels. It's not like Expedia, do you have a bed available? Um, we're really relying on the hospitals and the physicians who do the admitting and discharging to, to make those decisions. Uh, uh, question for Chris, actually. Um, part of that uh, delay in uh, surgeries and regular care was that people don't necessarily trust hospitals right now. They're worried they might get sick if they go there. There's concern that, uh, well, there are some hospitals that have policies in place where workers who recently tested positive still come into work. So how do we build that trust into the healthcare system? Yeah, well, I, well one, I, you should trust the healthcare system. So, I mean, one, I think you brought up two points. One, initially out of abundance of caution, a lot of care was postponed due to trying to prepare for the pandemic. So that demand was not being met. Now you have individuals who are immunocompromised or have chronic conditions that are not seeking regular care. And they're not seeking that regular care, they become sicker and sicker to the point where then they need an inpatient hospital bed that they would have during normal times not needed. So there's this, like this surge coming in because of that as well. So it's not just COVID related, it, it relates to the whole you know, healthcare system. Tom Simon, Williston Trending Topics. Uh, if we look out a week, a month, six months, are we now in the most critical times for low hospital capacity or is the worst yet to come? And uh, specifically in Williston where there's only four COVID beds, is that adequate, adequate care for available in Williams County? I, I think if anyone knew exactly what was going to happen, um, just like with anything, you'd, you'd be not in this business, but um, but to that end, the, it is still trending upwards. Um, the health systems are doing their modeling. So far, all the modeling has been right on, right on point. And if we do not limit community spread, it is going to continue to increase. So looking at those measures, if we can't limit community spread, 
going into winter, we will have capacity constraints. Did I? On the Williams County piece. So I, I can't answer specifically whether four beds is, is enough. I, I think it's important when we're thinking about this, it's hospitals will know how to isolate within their own buildings. Um, they can shift and change based on what the need is and where they can transfer to or not transfer to. What's more important though are those that are hospitalized with COVID. It's not about the beds, it's about the staffing. It takes more staff to take care of someone who's COVID positive than someone who is not COVID positive. All the more reason to be, follow the guidelines. For Chris. Uh, Scott Hennan, we've heard from multiple COVID patients who after testing positive were not able to receive medication right away and ended up in the hospital because of the delay. Is that something that can be fixed? I will have to follow up on that one. I'm, I'm not aware, and if Scott Hennan has examples, I'd be happy to follow up specifically. I'm gonna go back in the corner to Amy. Give a big shout out so we can hear it on the mic. Sounds good. Um, the North Dakota Public Health Association late last week sent you a letter on Governor Burgum, and in it they called for a, a statewide mask mandate. They say personal responsibility isn't enough. And then the other point that they raise is that they're concerned about the potential for budget cuts to public health next legislative session. Um, I was just wondering if you could respond to their concerns. Well, I, I think the, let's take the budget one uh, first. Uh, we've had the largest increases in public health budgets uh, ever seen in the history of the state during this pandemic, and those have been really fueled by uh, our allocations uh, through, uh, including with the, with the working with the budget section on the, the coronavirus relief fund uh, spending. And, and so the levels that we're at right now are completely unsustainable relative to our own state budget. I mean, the reason we've been able to move to this level of spending was because of the federal uh, stimulus. And this is, I'm sure, absolutely positively the case for every single state in the nation because so much money has flown into public health. Uh, the, uh, and so there's, we have to think about public health funding during the pandemic probably differently than post-pandemic. Uh, and we also have to think about uh, you know, where the dollars have come from. But at the levels, where, levels right now would be unsustainable with our own with our own state funding. So from a, if you go from a record level to something less, I'm sure they will call that a cut. Uh, and so there's likely that we would see in the future, and especially when the pandemic's behind us, we'll see it going back to more uh, typical run rate levels uh, in public health. And then relative to the letter, uh, there have been lots of organizations and individuals uh, that have made the, the call for uh, the mask uh, mandates. And I think we've discussed those at length uh, here. Uh, and, and what we are seeing uh, you know, they particularly were saying for a state one, uh, we're seeing uh, that their mask mitigation measures are going on at the city and county levels, which we think uh, make a lot of sense because that's the, the level of enfor where enforcement could occur. And so we're uh, certainly supportive of all that. Okay, then I'm, I'm gonna go to, uh, I'm gonna go to Dave Thompson, because I might've missed you some of these weeks. No problem. <laughs> this follows up on that. Since you talked about uh, CARES Act funding, there, there's again talk of another stimulus package. What needs to be in that stimulus package and should uh, funding for public health be in it? I think, the, I, I think if there is another uh, stimulus package, uh, the key to it is uh, there were some good elements in the last one, and part of the last one was a lot of flexibility for states. I mean, they gave quite strict guidelines that it had to be things that were outside your regular budget but related to COVID. And, and of course, there was lots of other details below that, but it allowed each state to make their own decisions. And so if, they would, if, the, if, if fresh dollars would come with a similar kind of, uh, similar kind of uh, flexibility at the state level for decision-making at our level, uh, where we can work with, uh, with all of the entities in the state, whether it's education, healthcare, uh, whatever it happens to be, uh, economic relief, uh, that kind of flexibility is really key. <clears throat> follow-up governor uh, if that new stimulus package does come in will it need to be a number comparable to what we've seen in the past or with the numbers we're seeing are we going to need more stimulus than the last time uh, I think the size of the stimulus bill uh, again it's all would all be speculation but it would it's probably going to depend a little bit on how the uh, 
uh, you know, how the race is when the counts get finalized, uh, because I think it's when it depends on, you know, who ends up controlling the Senate will probably determine both the size and the nature uh, and what other things get attached onto uh, the, because there was a tendency on some of the proposals that were defeated at the federal level, the so-called fourth stimulus bills that got defeated, uh, they started wandering away from COVID and into a lot of other areas where things were being attached onto them. So people might have, from both parties, might have been voting against them because they didn't like uh, the non-pandemic related uh, spending that was attached. So if they can stay focused on, I think they had one called the skinny bill, uh, which is really COVID related, maybe they can find uh, during the lame duck session between now and uh, January, uh, they could find uh, some uh, some agreement around some things that could give states uh, additional uh, needed support. I think one of the one of the areas again uh, that has been very beneficial. We've, we in North Dakota, like a lot of states, have been using the National Guard extensively, and we've got uh, authority for them to be on federal funding uh, through December 15th. Uh, if they had to switch over to being on state orders, uh, that changes the economics for the state, but it also changes the economics for an individual guardsman in terms of how they log their time in federal benefits. And I think we would be, the nation would be well served if those uh, federal National Guard benefits were part of that package. That's something that would be really important in North Dakota. Okay, I'm gonna go uh, 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 Jeremy and then uh, and then we'll work our way over to everybody else, Jeremy. Uh, Governor, I'd like to ask you to look back on the whole pandemic response briefly. Um, I'm wondering what do you think your administration has done well throughout the pandemic and what could have been done differently? Well, I think we're always asking ourselves, what can we do better? I mean, we ask ourselves that every day and we also, uh, are always looking forward and not, you know, maybe at the time when the pandemic is over, we'll do a look back. Uh, but I would say one of the things that the state has done uh, exceptionally well is on uh, the testing efforts, because when you're number one out of all 50 states in terms of the, the, the number of PCR or gold standard tests completed, then you have to say, hey, that, that was, uh, there was a lot of people that need to take credit for that for that work, so that's uh, that's something you know. In terms of the uh, the you know how we've managed so far, we've we have managed so far uh, to be among the lowest in terms of the fatality rate. We've managed to uh, have. Uh, our hospitalizations up until recent weeks were uh, quite manageable through this whole thing. Uh, and we've managed to figure out a way working with education and business to have our economy more open. So the combination of better health outcomes with a, with a stronger economy, because it, the, the, when we talk about managing the pandemic, it's not just managing the health aspect. It's also about, you know, we've ended up in the, you know, fourth lowest in terms of unemployment. Uh, we are, have had the, one of the least sh uh, shrinkages in terms terms of our GDP, so it means our economy has done better than others on a relative basis. And I think we've got a higher percentage of kids actually in face-to-face -face schooling than most states. So so I'd say by a lot of measures, uh, you know, North Dakota has, has been a, a, a strong example of how to have a balanced holistic approach, but is it, you know, but do we wake up every day and, and pat ourselves on the back? No, we wake up every day and like today, and you're like, you know, holy cow! You know, too many people are dying, and we've got a, uh, we've got more work to do, and we need we need to have more people get engaged uh, at all levels uh, in in you know being uh, compassionate and committed to uh, supporting their community or healthcare workers. So I, I'd say that the thing that we uh, that that we are challenged with everywhere, uh, everywhere is is how do you how do you get uh, a people with widely held and differing beliefs, because there are some people that uh, believe uh, deeply that the pandemic is the most important thing and mitigation is the most important thing. And then we've also people in our state that, you know, that might believe that the, this thing is overblown and is, uh, uh, is no different than the flu. We hear that all the time from some segments. So when you've got people with widely different beliefs, you know, how do you get a body of people moving forward when they're all starting from different points of, points of view? That part's a challenge for everybody, but in the, uh, there's a, you know, a group of, 
uh, you know, I'd say a group of people in North Dakota, which is, uh, you know, now maybe over the majority that is like, hey, uh, we can figure out a way to get through this if we get through it together and let's do the smart things together as a team, a community, a school, a university, uh, a congregation. Let's figure out what we've got to do together or as a family. What do we got to do to get through this thing? And I think we're seeing that showing up uh, by the, uh, you know, the, 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 not just the actions of local leaders, but the support in the communities for those actions. You know, that's the real, it's a real key. Uh, at that level too. So we're, but uh, again, coming together, uh, coming together and, and having, uh, again, more powerful in government, but coming together and having an understanding as humans that this uh, virus can only be transmitted from human to human contact and our behavior matters should be a lesson we remember for our whole life that the actions of each of us affect others in ways we don't understand. And that's something that I, I think maybe will be a lesson for all the, uh, for all the people coming out of this. And, and like I said, I think North Dakota is gonna emerge stronger, particularly if we can get through this with the solution being coming from, the, from people choosing to be part of the solution, we will be stronger coming out the backside. Mentioned there are people on both sides. Do you put merit in the argument that this is overblown? Do you listen to the people who say that at all? I, I care with uh, compassion and understanding for every North Dakotan about, it, but it, whatever their belief system is, and and it's one of the interesting things about uh, being governor is you represent every citizen in the state. You don't you don't just represent the people that. That, that that agree with you, uh, you know. I represent everybody that you know. I represent everybody that whether they voted for us or didn't vote for us, whether they believe what we believe on topic A or topic B. We represent all of them, and we listen to all of them. And uh, understanding where people are coming from is an absolutely necessary tool to help us navigate our way through these uncharted waters, because. Uh, because again, it, you know, if someone believes something in their heart and soul, doesn't matter what I or anybody else would say from this podium, probably is not going to change their mind. So then that creates part of the operating environment we're in. And then how do you, how do we, how do we move, how do we move forward together uh, with that? Okay, uh, I'm going to go Morgan and then uh, Adam. Um, so this is an election-related question. Yesterday you made an appointment to the District 8 House seat. I wanted to ask some questions on why the timing of just yesterday, and then why not consult the Attorney General when he had already made a legal opinion? Well, I want to make sure that we, in these conferences, that we uh, focus on, on the pandemic and not on uh, non-pandemic related things, but uh, I'll make a small exception uh, here uh, to answer the first part of your question on the timing. It would have been uh, impossible to do anything before yesterday because our action was dependent on the election results of Tuesday night. And I do, I do want to say to uh, Dave Andall's family, I mean, the tragic passing of him uh, during this uh, window of time when there's not a uh, remedy in statute on how to replace other than through an appointment, uh, then that is a... Um, you know that that's just really unfortunate. We feel for feel for his family, but that relates to the relates to the timing of it. Uh, but we stand behind the appointment, and uh, and I think what's going to happen forward will be the normal, the more the normal give and take in in politics uh, between the executive branch and the legislative branch, or between uh, executive branch members who may have different opinions. Uh, but it's, it's all within the normal course of uh, of what's of what's gone on, and it's this not it's not without. Uh, this isn't without precedent in our state, uh, and so again, I we're uh, this, this is something that's just taking a small amount of our attention. The 99 percent of our attention is focused on the, the pandemic, uh, and maybe maybe not 99 because we're spending a lot of time getting ready on the budget for the budget session. Uh, but this was just a, 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 a felt a obligation to fill my constitutional duties as, in the governor's office, and it really wasn't about politics. It was ensuring that the people of District 8 have a great representative to. Uh, to represent them in the upcoming legislature. Okay, uh, I'm going to go Adam, and then, and then I'm going online. Uh, Governor, last week you mentioned or you cited a few of the doctors who you've been consulting during the pandemic. I think you named among them Dr. Wynn, Dr. Connell, um, and Dr. Carson. Can you speak to some of the specific advice that you've been hearing from them? Uh, the I want to just say to all of them and, and, and lots of others as well, but those, those three in particular have been uh, participating at a number of different levels. Uh, and of course, Dr. Connell's been here as part of the, uh, been at the podium at 
during the pandemic. Uh, Dr. Wynn was on a video call with him yesterday. He's uh, doing two things for us. I mean, he's leading the, uh, the, the health strategy, uh, which really relates to part of the question, I think, of sort of what Amy might have been getting at early on, which is, you know, when you, what's, what's public health look like after the pandemic is over? And I think it should look different than it did going into the pandemic because we will have learned so much. And he's working on that long-term strategy piece. He's also leading the, the university level of the, of the sort of the, the smart restart or the return to learning programs at the university level. And I, I, I know that the people from the medical profession uh, are, are strongly advocating uh, always for more mitigation sooner. I'd say that's a sort of consistent thing and I respect them for that and that, that's how I would put generally all their their uh, comments in that uh, category. Uh, and and we, are, we share the belief in more mitigation sooner. So we're aligned in terms of what we wanna happen. It's we probably have different views of what's the best way to, uh, you know, do you get there through uh, increased individual participation or do you get there through, uh, you know, with a with the heavy hand of government or, the, or, a, or a strong uh, reliance on individual responsibility and those are two, uh, two perhaps differing approaches. Uh, in the end of the day, that all falls back on me, but we absolutely positively, I agree with them that more mitigation sooner would be a good thing. Okay, online. Mike Smith, 660 KUYZ in Williston. Uh, have you seen videos of bars being packed during Halloween and are you concerned of Halloween spike? Uh, I haven't, uh, Spent a lot of time on uh, Instagram or TikTok looking at Halloween videos, but I, I'm, uh, I've got some young staffers. I've heard about them, uh, and uh, and hopefully, uh, you know, one of the blessings of Halloween is that hopefully, uh, at least when they, uh, if they had a costume, hopefully it had a mask on them uh, as part of that costume, and maybe that had some mitigating effect. But uh, we said that last week. We knew that was going to be a concern, and and so we're. Uh, we, we knew that was going to be a concern and, and maybe there'll be a spike, but I, I think the real, uh, the real issue is, I mean, there may have been large gatherings and bars unmasked uh, every weekend, you know, all fall. And we knew that uh, this summer that we had some things that were related. We talked about the sandbar parties this summer here, but again, the sandbar parties outside on a windy day, probably the risk was a fraction of what it was compared to being in a, in a bar where you've got low circulation. So we hope there's not a, a Halloween spike, uh, but again, flu season and has always seen, we've always seen an increase in hospitalizations over the winter. We've seen an increase in flu and respiratory, I say flu because respiratory pneumonia deaths go up during the winter season. And, uh, and so we're combining both the traditional pressure on hospitalization and respiratory diseases. At the same time, we've got this new novel coronavirus, uh, which can be uh, very deadly for people uh, that are elderly. Uh, it's a, and so again, we're, you know, yeah, we are concerned about spikes. I said it last week, we're concerned about a Thanksgiving spike, a Christmas spike. We're concerned about kids coming home from college spikes. We're, uh, there's a lot of things to be worried about during this season that we've got coming up in conjunction with the, the nature of where we are uh, in, uh, in North Dakota. So that's, uh, th those are concerns. Okay, uh, I, we got one, one more online, I think. And then we're doing our we're doing our one per. Sorry, guys, we're trying to get around the table. I think we got to everybody. Uh, one more online from somebody fresh. Austin Erickson, KVRR in Fargo. Uh, as you said, North Dakota has a record number of new COVID-19 cases and deaths. Uh, what would it take to do more than raise county risk levels, such as putting in a mask mandate or closing businesses? Uh, and also, do you believe numbers show the argument that personal responsibility is the only way to cut down on the virus? Uh, that argument isn't working. Well, it's a, <clears throat> there, there's a lot to unpack in there and there was multiple questions in there. Uh, and I would say the, uh, uh, the first thing is that individual responsibility does work. People that, that maintain physical distance, uh, practice hand hygiene, avoid crowded spaces, uh, wear masks, uh, you know, take extra caution around, around vulnerable people. Uh, those people are not spreading the virus. Uh, and so, in, 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 and the only way you can get that to happen uh, is not through enforcement, that's through individual choice. Uh, and even when we talk about the, the, the positives that work in 
healthcare, whether it's in long-term care or whether it's in uh, you know clinical hospital environments, those individuals, when they're there, they're masked up. They're using PPE appropriately. They are doing all the things. They're, they're definitely washing their hands for more than 20 seconds. They're doing all the stuff that hospitals have always done, only doing more of it because of more PPE and more stuff. Where, those, where the healthcare workers are getting infected is back out in the community. And that's why we say if we can control it in the community, we can protect our healthcare providers. And so it is, uh, we, know that, uh, we know that those mitigation measures by healthcare professionals work. We know that personal responsibility works. And, uh, and I think what we're seeing is we raise the guidance levels uh, to uh, now to the whole state, to yellow and orange, uh, this is a framework to allow people at the local community to take the mitigation strategies that work for them uh, where they can get the highest amount of participation because participation depends on understanding the culture of your community. It, underst it depends on understanding what motivates people uh, to jump in and participate. And the best people in position to do that are gonna be our mayors and local, local elected officials, our school leaders, our parents. And so again, as a state, uh, it makes complete sense to me that we're actually trusting and counting uh, on families and communities uh, and schools and other organizations to be on the front lines of this of this battle. Uh, and, uh, and, and, I, and I think that, the, that it's going to improve out that not only we're going to get through it, but we're going to come out of it stronger because people are going to realize that their role as individuals makes a difference and what they do as individuals matters. And we can stop having a discussion about the role of government and start having a discussion about how do we build a uh, communities with people that are enlightened enough to understand that their actions affect all those around them. That'd be a beautiful thing for our state and maybe a great example for the world. Okay, with that, I wanna say thank you to everybody for being here today. Uh, we don't have a scheduled time uh, next week, but uh, stay tuned. Uh, thank you all for uh, all of the great work that you've been doing uh, throughout the pandemic as well. Take care.